Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Sarah Herda. I'm the director of the Graham Foundation. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all here on what feels like a hot August night. <laughs> um, tonight is the start of an integral aspect of our current project, Turquoise Dyson and the Winter Wells School. One part exhibition that is down stairs on view in the galleries. Um, and there is no doubt that Turquoise has made a beautiful exhibition that includes um, new sculptural works, drawings, and paintings, all brought together in an installation that instrumentalizes abstraction to, pro to probe pressing contemporary issues of environmentalism, race, and space. But this project is more than an exhibition. It is a convening, or a series of convenings and platforms created by Turquoise to invite different experts and expertise into a collective discussion and ultimately to create a new kind of space to form and ask questions. We are thrilled to work with Turquoise to explore and support this space-making initiative and thrilled to start the experiment with tonight's speaker, Mitch McGoon, a Graham grantee. Before I hand things over to, to Turquoise, I would like to note that this experiment would not be possible um, without her expansive and generous approach to her practice. Um, and we thank her for everything that she has put into this project so far and everything that she will put into this project as we kind of spend um, uh, the summer together. And the Graham is excited to support Turquoise's practice through our new fellowship program, a new program that provides support for the development and production of original and challenging works and the opportunity to present these projects in an exhibition here at the Madeliner House. The fellowship program extends the legacy of the Foundation's first awards made in 1957 and continues the tradition of support to individuals to explore innovative perspectives on spatial practice in design culture. As a Graham Fellow, Dyson is in residence um, throughout the run of our exhibition, and we hope to see you throughout the summer as this conversation and forum builds. Um, and after the talk, I'd like to invite you all downstairs to continue the conversation, um, to experience the exhibition, and now please um, join me in welcoming Turquoise Dyson. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Ava. Thank you, everyone, the Graham, <laughs> for so generously welcoming me um, and my um, experiences and efforts to expand the Winter Wells Drawing School for Environmental Liberation. It's really unique to have institutions support um, a sort of expansive aesthetic form experimentation while doing so much work around um, um, research and around environmental politics, around intellectual thought, around what it means to be a citizen today. So I really appreciate you all, and I'll probably say this with every event <laughs> that comes because it's, um, it's really astounding to feel this way. So thank you. Um, now to Mitch. I'm going to read um, something that I wrote about Mitch, um, and I hope that you, after reading this, have even more feelings, inspirations to really dig into Mitch's practice and projects of the past. I'm not going to read um, a traditional bio. I'm going to read to you a sort of personal note, a personal connection, a personal experience that I've had with Mitch over probably about 10 years now. So um, I hope this is true, and I feel that it's true, um, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I enjoyed writing it and engaging with, with Mitch. I didn't know Mitch McEwen when she helped me change my perspective on space. It was 10 years ago in bed at an event at Superfront. I heard through the voice of artists, activists, writers, poets, performers, that there was a space that I should be, a space to be held and seen, and that I should go. I did this quietly. I obeyed my peers. I can't remember the year, it was so long ago. But I remember the ethos, the social calling, the architectural structure, the light indelibly tied to my notions of value in light as social architecture, the cumulus beginnings, 
where I first saw the illustrious blacks. I first saw Ashley Kim, rigorous artist who lived also in Bed-Stuy, that Mitch provided a space to shine, to glow, to be present, to invent. Rigorous artist who would then activate near the railroad in Bed-Stuy, right off Atlantic Avenue, a critical question around body and risk. This place was about love and invention. I say this to you now in this grand ballroom as I think about time and knowing. I understand it to be true. Superfront, Superfront was the first frame of space that invited us all. It was a place where people scaled walls, played with gravity, and made breath in architectural space, an interior that championed ideas. Mitch was an idea person, composed, and mind you, I, didn't meet, I hadn't met her yet. I was in Best Eye in her place with hundreds of people, and I had not met her yet. Composing ideas in real time, making them, making them true, fungible, multiple, malleable, for the next several years, before I ever met her, I would watch from a distance her offer space for invention. I realized after growing myself that she was not only a critical thinker, but she was a radical person, a radical person now, and I could feel it viscerally in my bones. I mean this to be true. The body, ideas, matter, narrative of her, transversing Detroit, Chicago, New York, developing, transforming space slash labor, seeing and being seen under acute revelation of wellness and awareness. She is a developer who produced spaces for an in intelli intelligentsia that addresses social, political, and environmental prowess of the now a profound transformer bound by the most pluralistic ways of both wing and anchor to a phenomena of atmosphere. I am always inspired. More recently, she did it again. I'm speaking of An Office, a Detroit design team Mitch McEwen co-founded. The team participated in the Venice Architecture Biennale of 2016, focusing on infrastructure, air quality, industrial plants, and intercontinental trade. This confirmed what I knew. She was a person of praxis and theory, a painter, a sculptor, an architect, a writer, a developer, a drawer, a person who dissolved form in favor of language, invention, and prosperity. Earlier this year, when Mitch visited me at the Drawing Center to bring her dynamic class from Princeton all the way to the Drawing Center in New York to talk about Du Bois, Philadelphia, migration, a safe space for, an infra a space for us to think about infrastructure, I understood that she was a critical voice in the poetics of the art world and a critical voice of geography, body, and space again. I welcome you, Mitch. I welcome you. I welcome you. And I hope this is the beginning of a long conversation. Welcome. So I told, I told Turquoise that I was glad that she shared the text with me uh, about 15 minutes ago so that I didn't choke up hearing it for the first time um, just now. Um, but I still am choking up a little bit hearing it even though I read it. Um, so thank you. Thank you for that incredibly generous introduction. It's a lot to, uh, to live up to in, in this moment talking to all of you here at the Graham Foundation. And the Graham Foundation, I also appreciate it. It's, uh, it's a, an entity that has funded uh, my projects, really my most experimental projects, uh, one of which um, I have snuck into this uh, way of talking about Torquasi's exhibit um, as a mode of uh, dialogue um, with Torquasi and also I think between, between architecture and what is doing. Um, so I'm calling this talk Political Ecology of, of, of Hypershapes um, because I, I understand this, this exhibit to be um, really uh, a, an exhibition of this series, um, which is both an idea and a kind of seriality in the work of, of the hypershape. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show some of the works, but obviously you can see them much better here. Um, um, but I'm, I'm going to walk through this in a, in a few uh, 
ideas that really are, are still kind of loose, so they're gonna they're gonna kind of you know negotiate each other. But I think hopefully I'll be also precise, and I think in that way maybe relate um, to to the to the works here as well. Um, so. It has been, it's been thrilling to see Dyson's work take these different approaches to scale, medium, and authorship, um, you know, over, over time. Um, also different approaches to collaboration, to site. Um, it's been almost a decade, um, you know, from afar and by happenstance that we've been in dialogue with each other. Um, so today I'm sharing thoughts with you as an architect, um, but also as someone who works with artists, someone who thinks about art, not, not as a curator or an art historian. Um, so, um, you know, question what I'm telling you in all ways. Um, but the talk that I'm giving today, I'm, I'm calling the political ecology of hypershapes because I'm, I'm using the phrase political ecology um, in the Bruno Latour sense, um, the Bruno Latour notion of not a kind of green politics, um, but a broader shift brought by ecology into the realm of politics. Um, in terms of what can be considered political, right? So, so the way that ecology broadens what might be considered political, and the way that the politics of, of extraction and industrialization broaders what might be considered ecological, what, what might be considered ecological, right? So that's that's the way that I'm, I'm using political ecology. In addressing Dyson's work, um, beyond talking about that, that theoretically, I'm not going to spend time on that because I want to really talk about drawing. Um, and so there's four ways that I'm going to do that. Um, one is architectural drawing uh, and projective geometry. I'm going to compare the work to some uh, architectural references that are fairly well known in the architectural world. Um, maybe they don't circulate as much outside the architectural world because they're not necessarily built works. Um, two, I'm going to talk about ecology in terms of water and waste and use some of my own projects, one of my grant, uh, Graham Foundation funded projects to do that. Uh, three, I'm going to talk about what Adrian Piper calls the indexical present. And this is where um, I'm going to loosely look for, in the terms of Dyson's work, a way of, of talking about that within the terms of hypershapes. And four, i um, going to talk about the subjectivity of people in boxes, right, which is something that's at work here in the hypershapes. And how that is, in a way, uh, it opens up a, a Kantian question about aesthetics. Right, aesthetics writ large, um, and in that way, I will end up with uh, the Sylvia Winter reference. That that um, I mean, obviously, the title evokes both both Winter and Ida B. Wells, um, but I'll end up with a kind of dialogue between Dyson and Piper and Sylvia Winter around this this kind of Kantian question of of people in boxes. So, so to begin that with architectural drawings, I was supposed to show you these amazing works while you were listening to me just kind of babble. Sorry. Um, so but the, the kind of seriality that I'm talking about, right? Um, I'll, I'll come back to how the, the hypershapes operate um, individually and in series in relationship to what I was talking about, both the looseness and the precision, um, right? But, but also you can see um, already that the, 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 the way that the works relate to that frame, um, which is where this box is, is kind of haunting. Um, the kind of that, that narrative box, which is also the, the box as an object in the narrative of escape, right? Um, kind of the, being indexed by the, the frame of the page. Um, but I think this, this Lefebvre, this is a quote um, from Lefebvre, which is about um, the, the kind of social aspect of architecture in a way, right? The way that space is already social. And this is a way that I like to define what architects do, right? Before I start talking about architectural drawing, um, let me just talk for a moment about what it is that architects do, right? Because we don't actually build. Um, some architects do. generally were terrible builders. If you want something built, don't ask an architect, right? An architect will take way too long and will be concerned about the color of screws and things that don't matter, right? Architects draw, right? Um, and, and the way that I would kind of define what architects do, one way of thinking about what architects do is that, um, is that we work um, in a kind of opportunistic service of the social present, right? And that's very much not every architect obviously would say that, but I would say that's distinct from, say, the nostalgic, right, or the antisocial. Obviously, there's some architects you could say are antisocial or nostalgic, right? So, so this, is, this is very much what I would say is the, is the kind of ethos and value and also the discipline of architecture, though, is, is to be in that social present. Um, so, so in addition to the kind of theoretical, um, you know, the, the, so the, the hypershapes, of course, are not only drawn. Um, they, they also 
scroll, but I think that way that the, that the hypershape relates to both object making and drawing is, is something that um, I think has to do with projective geometry, but not in a technical way. So I will talk a little bit about projective geometry as well. Um, but first, two architectural examples just to situate us so that we're not talking about building, right? Building is different than architecture. Uh, this is a drawing from the Chamber Works, which is a series that Daniel Liebeskin did. Um, you know, I would say maybe he was funded by the Graham Foundation, but I actually know that he was chair of the department at Cranbrook when he did these, so maybe he didn't need funding from the Graham Foundation. But this is the kind of exciting and important work that the Graham Foundation would fund because it's very experimental. Um, and here I would, I would compare this to what, to what um, Dyson is doing in, in the sense that um, there's a, a, a lot of concern for the dynamism of the page, of course, more than, say, a defined figure. Um, you know, I think there's, there's sculptural works that I'm seeing today for the very first time um, that I would say maybe relate to the kind of architectural drawing that's happening here in the Liebeskin, um, maybe more than the hypershapes on the page do, right? So there's a way in which what I'm calling that projective geometry is operating between the, the sculptural aspects of the hypershape and the page. Um, but here in Liebeskin's work, it's called Chamber Works, and I think I've got another one, where it's a little bit more evident that part of the game that's being played out here is, is the game of the musical score, right? So, so Liebeskin, who also has a background in music, and I think there's a kind of interdisciplinarity in Dyson's work as well that, that maybe opens up some of these capacities, that in, in Liebeskin, he's, he's, he's operating between the, the, the indexical, um, architectural line, right, and then notation of music, right? So in a way, Zanakis does this as well, um, where, where the, here you can actually see the, the kind of banding of something like a musical score, right? So, so here there, there, is, there is a referent on the page that has a very specific um, uh, kind of, um, uh, uh, not just rituals, but traditions to it, right? Um, so I, I, the, the hypershape, I'd say, is more free and, and takes on more questions, broader questions of aesthetics and subjectivity. The second um, architect that I would put in dialogue with the hypershapes in terms of how they dialogue with architectural drawing is Zaha Hadid. I think this might be the only Zaha drawing that I'm showing here. This is early work of hers for um, a firehouse in Vitra. And here, and again, I, I, I think um, you know Zaha could be understood as someone who is interdisciplinary in the sense that she's working as a painter, right? So, so, so she's, she's working um, in terms of these planes in space and how they have a, a dynamism that defines uh, the, the street um, in their relationship to, to, to other kind of thresholds in those planes then become, become walls. Um, here, I think the reference, you know, uh, is, is the kind of Russian um, um, which is which is a very much about the, this kind of projective geometry of the infinite. So one of the things that I want to I want to talk about is this kind of finitude and how it operates hypershapes. Um, so so now moving on to ecology in a kind of direct way. Um, this is a, a project that uh, I've been doing in Detroit for a while that deals with water, and and I think that. For me, the other thing about the hypershapes that is architectural, not in the way of how it's drawn, but in the way of how the hypershapes narrate, um, or how they relate to narration, how they relate abstraction to narration, is that, is that they open up possibilities of talking in the midst of abstraction about very specific histories of violence, right? Um, and so here, I, the work that I've been doing in Detroit since I set up um, my architectural practice there, is very much the ways that the space of the city produces these violent operations. Um, so this is mapping um, demolitions in the city, but it's also mapping that in relationship so that the black, um, sorry, those aren't demolitions in this drawing. These are, these are publicly owned properties. So there's a vast kind of public ownership in Detroit, um, which can actually be made um, a kind of value for the city. Um, but here the red is mapping these uh, combined sewer overflows. And there's a way in which the entire city has been designed to take the sewage from the suburbs so that, so that the, the, the suburbs, which are overwhelmingly white, then do not experience the same flooding of their own sewage that then is pushed to Detroit, which is 80% black. Um, the, this drawing is the drawing of the demolitions, um, where the demolition, the, the city is kind of demolishing itself 
um, really very much in line with um, eviction policies. Um, of course, there's extensive poverty, but the demolitions themselves also have a material reality. Um, so, so one of the things that I've been trying to figure out is, is how to work in these large swaths and fields um, so, that, so that there can be uh, a design, uh, a, 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 some kind of negotiation of these existing patterns that, that operates in a way um, as, as much in a field condition as, as these patterns of, of, of you know, waste and ecology are operating as a field condition. Um, and to do that means also to understand um, money and, 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 and these other kinds of circulations, not just form. Um, and so one of the things that I've been working on, and I did this, I started these drawings about two years ago, I'm excited to get back to them in relationship to hypershapes, because I think the hypershapes are kind of breaking open where this drawing that I'm doing is more um, sort of carving. But, but this is interested in sort of ways of drawing what exists, where, where the uncertainty of what exists is built into it, because there are about 50,000 vacant houses in Detroit, and no one is really, really cataloging them. No one is really keeping track of how they operate. So to show the one gram funded project that attempts to, to operate differently on a house, um, before I close out this, this kind of architecture dialogue with the hypershape, um, I've been thinking about how houses um, are sort of in excess to themselves as, as, as forms, how what is it about a house that needs to look like a house, and how that keeps a house from doing other things that aren't house-like. Um, so this is a project that the Graham Foundation funded called House Opera that, that split open um, an existing vacant house in order to make it do something that houses don't do, which is to be public and to perform for the neighborhood and, and to be a place where people could come together, similar to the Superfront um, uh, location in Brooklyn that, that, that uh, Torquase was describing, that this could be a place that, that as an as a existing public uh, object, if it's opened up in, in a specific way that it could operate publicly, effectively, rather than reverting to that kind of image of itself as private. So that's, that's um, the, the, the kind of architectural lens through which I'm seeing the work, and that's what's behind the, the rest of what I'll, I'll walk through today in terms of the more theoretical um, and aesthetic questions uh, around, around what I'm calling, or what Adrian Piper calls the indexical present, um, how that relates to the hypershape, and then this question of the subjectivity of, of people in boxes. Um, I skipped over a Robin Evans quote um, that actually would be a good segue here from, from the architecture to these other questions of aesthetics. Um, in in uh, translation and projection, architecture's third geometry, Robin Evans, who's one of the, the kind of major canonical thinkers around architectural drawing, he said, what I want to emphasize he said a lot of things. This is one thing he said. Um, what I want to emphasize is that those spaces of 19th century geometry that captured the imagination of modern architects could only be present in architecture metaphorically. Architects could not use the fourth dimension or hyperbolic space in the same instrumental way in which they used triangles or projections, but they could allude to them, and this is what they did. So, so this is a, a critique of modernism and how modernism then moves into more concerns around geometry. But I think this is, a, for me, a, a way of thinking through the relationship of metaphor um, to line work and how that is different than illusion. Um, so this, this drawing, for example, um, I think one of the things that happens with the level of abstraction in relationship to the, 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 the line specificity um, is that I would say it's not metaphorical, right? The use of architectural lines here. I'm calling these architectural because there's a distinct line weight that's different than the line weight and thickness here, right? Because there's a, late, a relationship between the, the line and the, and the page that implies some kind of uh, space or orientation or gravity. There's, a, there's line type with the, the dashing, right? So these are, the, these are the kind of tools of the trade of architectural drawing. But I think what's happening in something like this, a work like this that Dyson's doing, is, is rather than working 
in that metaphorical way that, that Evans described, which is very concerned with geometry in that kind of Russian constructivist way of a kind of metaphor of the infinite. Instead, it's operating in, and I think what, what Piper's calling the indexical present, which is, which is in relationship to these fluid marks on the page. And maybe this has something to do with the, the kind of discussions around architecture and liquidity as well, right? But there's a way in which the, the facticity of the drawing um, is, is, is being determined on the page, right? So the way that we might understand um, what's void and what's mass what's solid, what's an edge, what's a threshold, right, is being determined in this kind of liquid way that can't be over-determined in a kind of linear sequence. So there's some kind of negotiation of facticity happening in the midst of all this, this delineation of, 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 of these kind of um, architectural uh, moves. Uh, so, so that's... Okay, so this leads to, to, to the question... Uh, around the hypershape specifically. Um, how do we know, I think this is what the hypershape opens up as questions. How do we know a shape? That's one question, how do we know a shape? How do we know a material? Uh, what are the claims, fictitious, logical, pictorial, or otherwise, at work in shaping, right? Irrespective of a linear history. So these questions are distinct from, say, questions of, of uh, figure, right? It's distinct from questions of figure ground. Um, they're distinct from questions of life in the sense of still life, right? There's no life that needs to be still in order to be rendered in the hypershape because the, the, the capacity of the line work belies stillness, right? If you didn't have the liquidity of that material, you, you, you would not be able to produce the, the, the specificity of the line work around it, right? Um, so, in other words, wait, I'm sorry, this went too fast. What are the knowledge claims at stake in drawing? How do hypershapes trouble those claims? What are the terms of hypershapes abstraction and what do they tell us about the work that abstraction still has to do in relation to reference, to history, to freedom, or determine relations to something like a world, something like an ecology? And, and by that I mean, if you think about, say, a Rothko, right? There's a way in which a, a, a Rothko implies something like um, a sky in a really reductive way, right? Or implies a horizon line. There's, there's ways in which um, I think a lot of what we would consider abstraction relies upon a pictorial relationship to something like nature or landscape that these shapes are not concerned with, if I understand them, right? So if, for example, the era of the, of the Anthropocene or the Plantationocene means that nature in its classical construct is over, right, which it is, there's plastic everywhere, right? So there being no world not impacted by human industrialization, then what is abstracting, what is abstraction abstracting out, right? So if there's no nature, and if part of what abstraction has been abstracting out is, right, a, a kind of a, a, the pictorial aspect of nature, right? If we don't have nature anymore and we can't just depictorialize the natural and call it abstraction, right, then what is the work of abstraction? Um, if not nature or human stuff, then what is abstraction liberated from, right? Um, so if, if the kind of political ecology of the Anthropocene or the plantation Ocene, right, means that the human impact is everywhere, that means it's also in the abstraction. I think that's what the hypershapes, I think that's part of what they point towards. <laughs> yeah. Um, dive into, so also, just, just if I'm totally wrong, just tell me. <laughs> okay? <laughs> okay? Okay. Okay. Um, so Dyson's work stages these questions in terms of, um, at the same time, right, at the same time tethering abstraction to specific narratives of limits and freedom, right? So it's not like the, it's not like the hypershapes have no relationship to, to, to narrative. Um, they, they have these very specific narratives that they're tethered to. Um, so hypershapes are not forms in the platonic sense, nor are they figures abstracted. They are shapes related to forms. They shape shapes. They are the shaping of what might have been defined by form, but has been reshaped. Right? So they reshape the stories that they tell, right? Um, so the hyper is hyper as in excess. Uh, hypershapes, they claim too much, 
I think. I think that's part of the work they do is they claim too much. They hold stories that are barely fathomable, right? It's barely fathomable that one could live inside a box for years, silently hiding from being violently raped, right? And yet this happened. <clears throat> they hold stories that are under-historicized, right? But they don't hold them or figure them. They lightly index them through speculation, revealing the limit of information and the open range of speculation. And so I, this is where I think the hypershapes relate to that indexical present that Adrian Piper talks about. Um, this is a, a, a work that I'll talk about a little bit, Adrian Piper. Um, Adrian Piper says, in intuition, the subject and object thus related, i.e. put in unmediated contact, are the metaphysical kind of thing we can physically grab, or in the case of particularly vivid objects of imagination or memory, that can grab us. So the hyper shapes, I think, can grab us. Um, you know, when we when we look at them in the gallery, and I think when they become sculptural, they grab us, right? But but they also are a thing that we can kind of physically grab, and they relate to things that we can physically grab. And in that way, I think the making of them, the intuitive making of them has something to do with, 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 with how they speculate. Um, and here's where I want to close with talking about the Kantian aesthetics. Well, this, this Adrian Piper is this kind of indexical um, present where the drawing is dealing with um, that space on the grid. And it seems really obvious that, you know, the text that says, let me just check my time, the text that says here, the square area is third row from bottom, third from right side. Um, and the funny thing is if you search for this work online, you'll find an image of it cropped so that it somehow doesn't actually end up that way. So, so, so the grid grounds it, but can also be part of the device that makes it sort of meaningless and just an image again. But I wanna close with this question of boxes specifically and how I think the title of the exhibit brings in Sylvia Winter's concern for uh, who gets to be human and how we define who's human. So on, on people in boxes, there's, there's something that is specifically, uh, there's something very brilliant um, and, and, and succinct um, as a foil uh, for the terms of Kantian aesthetics that's, that's at work there and the, and the hyper shapes and how they relate to these narratives of people in boxes. Right, because the Kantian aesthetics in terms of the critique of judgment relies on the disinterested subject. Right? The, the, that's the, disinter the disinterested subject who has pleasure in a work is the one who can say what's beautiful. Um, and a person that's notoriously open to corruption by cultural or racial supremacy, right? which turns that into my viewpoints are objective because the authorities on the matter share my references, right? which makes me be disinterested or have the kind of cloak of being disinterested, right? And your viewpoint is more than it's narrow. Um, so the subjectivity um, is interested. The subject in the box is both extremely disinterested, right? Disinterested in the sense of being ripped from context and from situations, right? In a way, you can't get, you cannot become more disinterested in context than if you're in a box and you can't hear anything or speak or see, right? while also hyper-interested, right? The subject in the box is hyper-interested, right? Interested in, it's a life or death situation. Uh, so where does then, you know, I think again, talking about the facticity of the thing, <coughs> um, the relationship of, of each one, you know, is often then again closing its own boundary within the boundaries and also finding a way of breaking that, right? So the way that the, the, the circle is defined within the frame of the drawing, right? It doesn't break off, right? But then it breaks itself again. I think this is part of the, the intuition of the, the hyper shape there. The narratives of the subject in the box might be comparable to that the cat in the black box that becomes a shorthand for imagining the probability wave theory of photons, right? The kind of Schrodinger cat in the box, right? The post-Einstein understanding of mass in the universe. There's a lot of mass um, between the the sculptures and the drawing. But the narratives of the subject in the box might be schematized into three questions that delimit the entire potential knowing, right? The, the potential knowing of the subject in the box. So if there's knowledge in that box, that knowledge, right, because in the critique of judgment, kind of the beginning of aesthetics, it's judgment and knowledge are, 
you know, like that. Um, if there's knowledge in that box, that knowledge might be considered as one perceiving the box, two, coming from being in the box, or three, um, knowledge that comes from the act of freeing oneself from the box. And to end with those three possibilities of that subject of the box, broadly, um, we might think of the first one, the knowledge that comes, that receives the box, in terms of the Zora Neale Hurston uh, text that's just recently published in Barracoon, um, page 17, quote, when Cujo comes down into his back field or away from home, he locks his gate with an ingenious wooden head of African invention. To the second situation, knowledge that comes from being in the box. We might think uh, in terms of Harriet Jacobs as the work invites us to incidents in the life of a slave girl. Uh, quote, this continued darkness was oppressive. It seemed horrible to sit or lie in a cramped position day after day, yet I would have chosen this rather than my lot as a slave. One day I hit my head against something and found it was a small tool for drilling. <coughs> my uncle had left it sticking there when he made the trap door. I said to myself, now I will have some light. Now I will see my children. I bored one hole about an inch long and an inch broad. Three, knowledge that comes from the act of freeing oneself from the box. That's the Sylvia Winter. Uh, Winter, in 1994, she wrote an essay called um, uh, Knowledge for the 21st Century, Knowledge on Trial um, in, in HI, Form in HI. <clears throat> and it came from the, the Rodney King trial, and NHI was, uh, was an actor for no humans involved, that the racist police officer used in talking about incidents that involved no white subjects. Uh, Winter says, my major proposal is that both the issue of race and its classificatory logic, as in David Duke's belief that the Negro is an evolutionarily lower level than the Caucasian, lies in the founding premise on which our present order of knowledge or episteme and its rigorously elaborated paradigms are based. This should bring you to that uh, Taking the map for the territory, the fallacy of superculturalism. What is this premise, she asks? Michel Foucault traces the processes by which our present major disciplines came to be put in place at the end of the 18th century by European thinkers to a central representation by means of which the human would come to perceive and know itself as it were, a purely natural organism in complete continuity with organic life. I, I think that the hypershapes um, relate these three ways of knowing in the box to each other, or relate to each of these individually and specifically, without substituting one mode of knowledge production, without reclaiming uh, one mode of knowledge for the other. And this is um, what I find incredibly fascinating. Thank you. Should we do questions first, though? However you want to... I hope I knew you were going to get shy. I knew you were going to get shy. Let's do questions. Well, I think that um, we understand shapes in relationship to space and condition, right? So we make a shape to do a thing, 
we acknowledge and see a shape for a particular kind of um, 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 using the shape for our own devices, right? So I think the question is, how do we make a shape to know a shape, maybe, right? So I'm thinking about the ways in which shapes are made intuitively out of duress, um, um, shapes are made um, in conditions of um, cognitive knowing, like how do we think about occupying a shape um, that then delivers a sort of a space of uh, uh, potential liberation, or how do we make a shape to deliver a space of invention, right? So it's this sort of shape making, um, shape knowing, I think as much uh, as a part about intuition, cognitive knowledge, and invention. I don't think today um, there's sort of a linear path to shape knowing. I think it's really about, um, I, um, I say post a sort of modernist industrial lens. I really think it's about um, knowing, making, figuring out shape in relationship um, um, to a, a kind of survival and a kind of invention for uh, a more profound livabil livability. So uh, the way in which we think about shape, um, I think is ontological in some ways. And those, uh, I think geographic, geographic histories, those ethnographic histories around shape have um, been underplayed um, for the sake of a kind of modernist mastering of shape. And I think it's time roll that back and um, talk about shape as a necessity for being human and um, who gets to be human or who gets to be human and create a shape, right? So I think these are all sort of bound together, specifically thinking about Sylvia Winter and this question of who gets to be, right? Who gets to make an iconic shape? Who gets to make a shape that's critical? who gets to make a shape that people have to occupy over and over again on the quotidian side on the f and the phenomenological side. So I think that um, this notion of shape making, I think we need to revisit without, um, I think as Mitch was talking about, the notion directly of a, a, a kind of narrative that, uh, that sometimes may overdetermine or underdetermine the capabilities of people in their, um, you know, relationships to a sort of radical shape making. I know that was a kind of roller coaster question, but it's a, a roller coaster moment, I think, with shape. <laughs> I got this one. Questions? There's a question there. You know, Euclid wrote the geometry after Plato, right? As if Plato had already figured out the geometry and just it just wasn't written succinctly enough or something. It didn't have enough diagrams to it. And and it was mainly coming from the, the Mino dialogue, which is which is just trigonometry is just stuck in there as a part of an argument about us having eternal memory in our souls, mm, mm. right? So I think what Tarkasi is talking about now in terms of like um, how shapes make things. Is, 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 is really then demanding uh, an episteme as well, right? Um, so I, and, and in that way, it's already architectural too, right? That, 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 that architecture, I, I think, is, is, is it, it, it has these broad claims built into it, right? I think, I think in Tarkasa's work, she's staking out the claims in the abstraction, and in architecture, those claims are built in because you're supposed to be dealing with society and all these things, but often it's easy for us to, to just, make kind of forms instead of doing the much harder work 
I have a question for Mitch. Mitch, I grew up in Detroit. I'm very curious about the work that you're doing there. For those of you who don't know Detroit, Detroit has a very substantive drives me exactly what you just said about Detroit, you know? I mean, uh, I mean, from from the early skyscrapers in the 1920s until, I mean, the Yamasaki buildings, you know, um, up and down Woodward are just in incredible. Um, but also the people are amazing too, right? So, I mean, I think, I think D Detroit, um, I grew up in D.C., and in a lot of ways Detroit reminds me of D.C. when I was growing up, not D.C. now. Um, but I think there's a funny thing that happened. I think this does relate in some ways to the, the kind of the, the, the dynamics of hypershapes in terms of a kind of racial uh, kind of indexing of, of, of abstraction somehow. That there's a funny thing that happened in this country in the second half of the 20th century where uh, white flight left all of this architectural richness to, to majority black neighborhoods, right? Um, and so I, I feel like the, the architectural field um, really missed out, that the architectural field should have had a whole, you know, wave of brilliant black architects just changing, you know, what, what, the, what the discipline could do in this country just from, just from growing up around this kind of architectural richness. Mm -hmm. But I, I think the profession mm -hmm. dropped the ball on that one. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to relate it back more to the, to yeah. the hyper shapes. No. Okay. You don't need to. <laughs> okay. Okay. You don't need to. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? No. Oh. I guess um, from what I understand is how that ties into shape making to um, you've been using some of your thought based on Sylvia Winter and, and her work about this idea of enfran enfranchisement of people within a certain sphere have certain rights and people outside that sphere do not have rights, which has been kind of something that we've never gotten quite past in our country. Um, and so in this, um, so you had mentioned that word, but you hadn't quite carried that through. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about that as it then relates to some of these ideas that you have um, uh, discussed in, in both the drawings and both in the philosophies. And I'm, I feel like that art is a way of not only knowing, but art is a way of becoming. So I'm going to situate you um, in my relationship to citizenship now. Right? So, I was, so my citizenship is much related to the ways in which um, black people sort of organize um, themselves to produce information around really sort of basic, legible, Geographies, um, I, would, I would say, um, fields of um, medicine. Uh, I would think about um, fields of politics and laws and policy, fields of history. Um, so my, my citizenship for the first, I would think, 30 years of my life is trying to make up um, a kind of, um, or leveling out 
of a real history in relationship to these things, um, as opposed to a constructed uh, sociality that was be, that was uh, that was uh, negated some of these histories at the same time. So the way in which I both catch up and make up in relationship to a larger master narrative is the way I sort of am defining or trying to define my citizenship. Well, in a sort of measurable way, I'm thinking about now, how do I then understand policy, policy building, policy making? How do I understand the history of neoliberalism? How do I understand the privatization? So I haven't even really gotten to, I think, an authority of citizenship that I can even claim. I have to really figure out how to position myself in the knowing of both history and contemporary, in, in this contemporary lens, and the both what does it mean to project or foresee a city or a land or escape, right? Because what they don't, what I never understood is planning. And I'm not talking about planning a week, a year. I'm talking about planning 20 years to 50 years, right? And I'm talking about city planning in relationship to geographic knowing and geography. So my idea of citizenship right now is to really sort of vote in these sort of hyper-local elections, understand how these things are networked together in systems, or not even system, systemic racism, but systemic orders are made, right? How, how do these, um, these sort of pluralist, pluralistic sense, systems of understanding become legible to me so that I can figure out what is autonomy versus semi-autonomy versus no autonomy? So, when I talk about citizenship right now, it's both um, something measurable that I'm trying to get into, something that I can feel instinctively, citizenship as a sort of empty form that I can fill myself, right? Um, but thinking about um, Mitch's work and being in storefront, being in Brooklyn in particular, and has spent a lot of time in Brooklyn not knowing what I was going to do with my life and entering a space where someone got a lease send out artist proposals, organize text, you know, really the sort of organizational sense around um, a sort of knowledge, right, field, a specialized field, but made it very, I would say, um, poetically quotidian, right? And something magical happens there. So when I think about my life and my experience in Brooklyn, it was a kind of thing where I was like all over the place. Um, but the citizenship of like breathing and knowing intuitively, um, and I'm just waiting, I'm just charging myself with filling that form with meaning as an adult person. You know, so it's, it's all of the above. So I don't have an answer for you, but I have a process that I'm sure about. But maybe you can answer this question. Oh, I see what your, your question is. Um, I see what your question is. <sighs> Interesting. So 
I must say, I don't think I was built, I was, I was raised under those conditions. And what I mean is, I was raised in the condition where um, I was around a group of people who both thought the academy, formal institutions, formal schools, the arts, um, politics, performance, um, both land ownership, my grandfather owned maybe four houses. So um, there was always uh, a multi-pronged pluralistic approach to both owning land, right, Glissant, dignity, land, poetics, ownership. But there was also um, a space for all of these other um, spaces of resistance, acute resistance, organized resistance, but also the building of architecture or thinking about architecture as a safe space. Right? When I was a child, I didn't really go to anyone's house that didn't own their house. I didn't, know, I didn't understand it, really, until later on. Right? Um, so when I was home, I was home in multiple spaces on the south side of Chicago, South Shore. Right? So um, this idea of architecture and citizenship and private citizenship and ownership and community was very vast, right? My grandfather was the president of Local One, the um, Hotel and Restaurant Union of Chicago. So I was in front of the Congress with my father who eventually worked with my grandfather protesting, right? Picketing, right? So these were childhood memories while I was both downtown in South Shore, in High Park, I went to Chicago Academy of the Arts. I majored in ballet. So I don't. So the idea of um, citizenship and architecture and space in Chicago, in particular, was very centered around um, a kind of uh, belonging. Not till I was sort of yoked out of that did I had to, um, um, I would say, recalibrate, right? Ideas of power and relationship. Right, not till later on, which I think is normal for humans who are, um, you know, so sort of growing up in America, under parents who um, really um, structure the foundation of knowing and understanding um, dignity, knowledge, rights, arts, like all these things. So I didn't really grow up in the condition of um, um, either or, or that or then, or us or them, you know, so I didn't, I didn't, I grew up, I didn't grow up under this condition that, that was like identity and then race and economy. I felt like class was my major um, condition with my grandfather, you know, just going to Local One and seeing all kinds of Chicagoans trying to figure out labor, right? So it's a, I hope I'm answering more, your question as best I can, um, but these are the, these are the histories, you know, Van Buren, <laughs> the, the, under the railroad tracks where the local one was, that black building, you know, on the third floor, going up in that building and, you know, and um, transversing, you know, the, the, you know the, the drive in the morning, going to school, you know, taking the bus, the six, like all of these things were, were kind of built um, into my politic. Um, so it was always these these everything, like all and everything, you know, power and power to the people, like some straight up power to the people shit, you know. Um, and I saw it function, I saw it operate, and then comes Reagan, right? And then comes the 80s, and then comes hip hop, and then comes, so it's a lot of, it's a, it's a lot to answer while I'm trying to figure out these things. But Hypershape is a way I can, um, figure out um, uh, an infrastructure of knowledge that um, even expands what I was br blessed with um, even as a child, this kind of condition of um, moving through space and, and think about architecture differently. So. Oh. I'll give it back, I promise. <laughs> um, I feel like the answer to this is like right in front of my face and I can't see it maybe, but I'm wondering from both of you how you're seeing or how you're um, talking about artifice with like the hyper shapes or seeing artifice in the hyper shapes because it seems like especially um, the narrative that you drew, Mitch, with like br down through Bruno Latour and also conversations about the Anthropocene and talking about how 
you know, what we're abstracting is like a little weird in 2018 because like we're already in this place where plastic is the abstraction of this other thing that was nature that, you know, but we also talk in like a technological field about how um, the abstraction, which is digital and, and ephemeral in those worlds are, and also like very, very artificial, right? And some people view that as very negative, especially I think a lot of the, the rhetoric around the Anthropocene is like, no, <laughs> you know, and Bruno Latour with like his work with like climate change and trying to like, reverse these things, like, do, you know, all these things. Um, it, it just, it feels quite negative, but I don't necessarily feel like either of you are talking about like artifice in a negative way, but it doesn't seem that this is something that's also coming up. Um, also, and just one more thing to, to draw artifice uh, to, the difference between creation and construction and seeing like maybe construction as a way to think about artifice. But also drawing from that, it's interesting talking about like the house that didn't house right or like the house that is preventing itself from being a house or doing house stuff. Um, yeah, I was just wondering like in terms of how that all is, like, you know, situated. Yeah, I can, I can start on this one. I'm, it's funny because Turquoise told me to put the image of House Opera up and I wanted to find more hypershape images. <laughs> um, but one of the, well, just to say quickly, I think with this drawing and your question, the materiality is, is kind of, um, it's all charcoal if I understand it, right? Or is it fixative also? It's not all. Char it's not all charcoal. Okay, because there's a charcoal watch toner. Okay, okay, but it's all toner. Yeah. So there's a way in which the 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 process of the work, the material process of the work, negates artifice. And maybe I could compare that to the way that, like here, the the construction was actually all removal, right? Um, but but then there's a way in which the line works here. I think there's, there, for me, maybe it's because I'm, I'm reading it kind of too architecturally, but there's a kind of really interesting game of artifice in the line works. Um, you know, the, the, the difference between a, a dash line, you know, is it cutting through something? Is it actually a different plane? You know, so, so there's this kind of like really rigorous material um, kind of, I don't want to say purity, but consistency, right? And then this, this kind of, um, these kind of games in, in terms of the facticity and the claims. And, and in that way, I, I, I think that's, um, for me, that's I think something that we do have to move into the, the ecological, right? These distinctions between like good materials and bad materials and natural materials, and I, that it, none of it means anything anymore. Right, so so you know, I think the the, the questions of, of really staking out, you know, how much do we care about carcinogens? Right, we're going to have to define that. There's going to have to be a politics around that. Right, there's these debates around glyphosate and all of that. You know, we can't say that there's not going to be any carcinogens anywhere because that's just not the case. Right, so so I think we need to have kind of more of these moments of of of. And that's where I think I think the 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 work points towards a, a different way of, of thinking about truth and facticity and subjectivity outside of these relationships to nature and figure and these other ways of defining life um, that I think at a theoretical level are, are really important for ecology. Well, um, good evening. And I wanted to say thanks a lot for uh, the wonderful lecture that um, both of you have given. Um, I was actually curious more from the position of architecture and Detroit. Um, I know a few, I mean, you mentioned, or you did raise issues of race and things like that. And, um, and it got me thinking, you know, like um, you talked about white flight, how Detroit missed an opportunity. And that opportunity, what is black architecture? What is um, space as it means to um, the African in the diaspora? You know, understanding, you know, that um, probably one of the most significant contributions to architecture from Africa is um, the veranda, 
And when you think of it, and you know, the way we sit on stoops and occupy space outside of a box and create an extension of what becomes defined as the way you know, of community, um, I'm curious, you know, in your practices, being, you know, how are you thinking of architecture beyond, you know, the um, the way we were taught in schools of architecture, you know, structure and all that stuff, but then the, the construction and creating of structure within space, not the physical built forms, but the ephemeral. You know that creates com you know that, that we use to communicate we use to um to be seen and to see you know to be you know to deal with nature all you know and so forth and so forth and i don't want to go too deep into it but you know to me you know i'm curious how what's the response in practice to actually the way we live as africans outside versus inside That question. <laughs> and the reason why I love that question is because I've been really uh, fascinated thinking about you know, the, the, the question that I think Marshall brought up, and that is how do we make a shape? And I know from um, research I've been doing maybe over the past three years, um, this sort of, this um, Sort of, and I'll just say it because I'm not an architect, so I'll say it is, it's probably going to come out a bit crude, but um, like nomadic architectural structures. And one of the images that I found in a text that I'm thinking about in nomadic architectural structures, particularly by um, Northern Kenyan women, the Tureg people, um, among many other tribes who negotiate um, um, being engineers and thinking about um, not things that are permanent, but things that are mobile, things that are impermanent, things that are built based on a sort of hyper-local climate of moving, things that can be constructed and deconstructed, materials that can be replaced, right, um, based on climate and environment. So for me, being brought, being brought up on the south side of Chicago again, then transversing to the south, and then moving up north, um, thinking about both Cameroonian architecture as it is designed in relationship to structure to structure in this sort of circular communal way, in relationship to the curve, and this kind of nomadic architecture where I would, you know, the, the women are engineers and building what some people would call, are you, are you? Yeah, no, no, uh, no to speak, actually to carry off from what you're saying about the nomadic architecture, there's actually um, a very minimalist approach to living that Africans have. Mm -hmm. You know, the fact that you could actually take your entire belonging on your head, going to visit a family friend maybe two days away. Uh, but I would argue that the interesting thing, and I'm arguing this, I'm, I, I say this with a, a hint of apology. However, I'm human and I can you know, perceive these things. So what is fascinating about um, this particular movement, motion, belonging, and invention is that a lot of these people were packing up to pack other people up, right? So there's a relationship between nomadic architectural engineers who are culturally defined by their ability to help other people move other places, right? So what does it mean to construct a house, construct um, transportation, construct materials that are then built in service and bound in the service of moving other people who are semi-permanent, right, based on environment? So with this idea of climate, global warming, change, what does it mean to be in a semi-desert? And what does it mean to belong to a people whose very vernacular is built on the assistance of others moving in the question of permanence and impermanence, right? So you can have women who are saying, okay, I'm going to you know, pack up and go for a day um, to gather, to lend, to build, to invent, and I'm going to gather the other women to help this, th these people then move other people. Right, so the, the interesting thing about us continental interdependency is that it's this really um, advanced um, 
um, kind of structural belonging in relationship to materiality. Now they don't have, de they, don't, they do not have design, they have design confidence because it's built into their humanism, right? I think the problem with, I think, a sort of American modernism is, is that it does say that someone is not human and someone is, um, is unhuman or um, can't be even known to be human. Um, and the problem with that is that it doesn't, that um, doesn't produce design confidence. So I think we have to think about um, in, 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 I think, more detailed ways how we look at engineers on the continent. And not just engineers who are responding and or um, in relationship to post-colonial aid as it pertains to engineering and architecture, post-colonial um, aesthetics and building and materials, but a real kind of um, um, ind indigeneity both based on ingenuity that has no brand, but is, I think, um, the, our salvation. So um, I think that as I sort of learn, um, and I, you know, this is not my field, but as I sort of learn how one makes a shape from the ground, from a tree, from a branch, right, the same kind of shapes that make our oxygen, I think that's a critical kind of science. Um, so uh, when we talk about, um, uh, uh, that's where I am now, thinking about these, these moments and my drawings. So my drawings, the curve is not only a curve in relationship to uh, people who escaped um, being enslaved from the south to the north and hiding in the hull of a ship, right? But it's also about looking at um, women who were bending long branches just before that they would snap in the moment of humidity, knowing the air and atmosphere to then construct something that their family could live in and under over all kinds of elements and then move another people, right, who were um, stable over and over again. So this is about a repetition, it's about a cognitive knowledge, it's about a material science that I think is genius. So when I talk about, you know, African and black genius as this sort of generic form, um, I think it's generic in the way that we should be, it's a given that this humanity, I think, is, um, we need to catch up to or catch back to. In this country, um, it's not an accident that the American Institute of Architects forms after emancipation, right? After slavery ends, right? Because the folks who were building the most complex buildings in this country, of course, were enslaved black laborers, right? And and so once those enslaved black laborers are emancipated, in in order for architecture to professionalize itself, it has to then problematize the freedom of that labor, right? And then distance itself. And and I think one of the things that the hypershapes point towards. Is, is joinery, right, in a kind of abstract way again, right? You imagine these two things that are joined together, but they're not really joined together. And, and there's, a, you know, that advanced carpentry is just one of the things, one of the many things that dissipates, right, with that kind of professionalization that distances itself from that problem of that free labor. Good evening, thank you, it's been, yes, my last question. <laughs> okay. um, it's gonna be a really easy one. Um, could you elaborate on nature and you saying it's dead and how sort of it's the plastic is the new nature? Uh, both of you, I'm coming, the reason I'm asking because I'm, I'm sort of in a shock mode right now because I'm coming from Telluride where I was at the mountain film where I was listening to all these very passionate, educated individuals speak on nature and climate change and migration. So I'm hoping you can tell me your thoughts on both. Well, this, this is I, I can't really quickly hinge this to the work enough, so I just kind of say quickly that um, there's a way in which uh, a kind of claim to nature as the beautiful and as the lost is also a claim to empire, right? Because, because it's through empire and colonization that you get to discover nature, that you get to put a frame around nature, um, that you get to claim the distinction between the natural and mankind, right? The indigenous people are always kind of problematized in this kind of beast mode, it's kind of in between. And, 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 and so there's, there's a relationship of, you know, all those things are related to each other. So, so nature's dead, it's convenient that it's so scientific that nature's dead because it was already dead. You know, um, it's a theological and a kind of, I think, a kind of a colonial question more than anything. 
Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, um, the idea of the need for the language nature. Like, why do we need that word? Why does it have um, so much power? How, why does it have so much resonance? Because it's an empty form. Right? You can buy a package of plastic and it have nature on it. And because of the way in which we understand material, material resources and you know, extraction to get to plastic, all of this ontological um, uh, sort of meaning is completely skipped over. So I think nature as a word, as a brand, and I think about you know, the brilliant Mel Bachner in this way. It's like, how do we really think about language as distinction? And the way in which people are problematizing the word nature, N-A-T-R-U-R-E, um, is just, it's, it's, it's really about a decolonization and how to hold that. So I do reject the language of, of nature, and I'm learning to reject it more specifically um, as a way to think about how colonization in relationship to global exchange, in relationship to different kinds of periods of modern modernism, industrialization, then have us leaning on what we believe to be natural or nature, especially in painting, right? So I'm tied to, I'm tied to um, the rectangle in nature and pastoral, right? I'm tied to that fiction. Um, and I'm tied to it in a way that I understand that that was the first surrealistic moment that wasn't radical. I'm not talking about the Chicago surrealist. I'm talking about a kind of surrealist that sort of talks about um, fiction and time and a kind of radical um, unbelievability, but I'm talking about the first kind of fiction was the um, the fiction of the colonialist describing um, a colonized genocide land as nature. Mm -hmm. Can you in there? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that once you got started, you would just keep going. <laughs>